All right, and we are live and we are back with another episode of Mentor Minutes. I've been away for the past three weeks traveling and having a vacation, and uh, that's what I kind of wanted to start this episode out as we queue up some people on here, is talking about vacations, time away, that time for reflection. Now, you'll notice I, I had a couple of episodes there where I tried to field it from outside and tried to field it from the road, and I really just wasn't getting the audio quality, quite frankly, um, to do those, so I kind of switched gears. And the switching of gears is with two particular ways that you can handle vacations and you can handle vacations for your team. Now, the best thing is for us to really detach from the operation every once in a while and get a fresh perspective and really get that rest to make things better down the road. Your work life, your personal life is just like a sleep cycle for human beings. You need that time away to come back refreshed and that's ideal. But a lot of people, and a lot of you out there may be similar to this, Sarah, Freddie, good to see you on here. It, they do want to be slightly attached to the operation, and this is usually how I've operated when I take time off or I'm traveling. And you've seen this before in years past where I'm filming from Hawaii and doing live Q&As and that sort of thing, and I like to work and I like to be engaged because a lot of your workers, and maybe yourself, are concerned about the unknown. What's happening in the operation when I'm not there? And so taking a limited amount of time, and I'm talking no more than half an hour a day when you're away on vacation, and being engaged is something that can actually make your time away better. It does no good to be super concerned and fearful that something's going on if you can just kind of keep tabs on it a little. Mohammed Eknath, it's great to see you here as well. Um, so what I recommend in those cases and what I had done in my uh, prior career is I told everybody that I would check email once or twice a day when I was on vacation. But if the email did not have, and I quote, a sexy title to it, I probably wasn't going to open it. So anything that had daily update in the email heading wasn't something I was even going to look at. I wasn't even going to open it. But Cameron, I need your help with this ASAP is a title to an email that I would absolutely open and then I can engage. And that puts you at peace of mind that the operation isn't falling apart or there isn't some particular thing that you could be involved in that would help um, keep the operation moving forward. Kimberly, good to see you here. And so that's usually how things go. That being said, with the little audio issues that I was having as far as doing these live sessions, I decided to completely detach and it was great. And as usual with vacations, I came back with better clarity, uh, more energy, and a better focus. And usually, and in this case it, was, it, it happened as well, some good ideas on moving the operation forward in your case or moving my work here forward in this case. And so that's why you've seen how we're going to talk about peaks and valleys. And I'm going to start doing a weekly like book review or book discussion really more um, every single week in regards to certain things. So if you haven't checked out peaks and valleys, do that. I'm going to be talking about it Thursday, 1230 Pacific Standard Time. So I'm away from work um, a little bit and uh, it's good to be back. And I wanted to talk Frith. So good to see you here. We need to do a live um, uh, to schedule our next session. So take a look at your calendar. I'll shoot you an email on that as well so you can schedule the next session with me. Um, so while everybody that's on here, if you have any questions, anything that's been frustrating you, any challenges you have with leadership, any just general questions, drop them into the comment section and I'll tackle those as they start rolling in. But the topic I also want to talk about today is dealing with failure. And I have a few things that I really wanted to highlight as far as failure is concerned for you to kind of round out the discussion as we work between questions here. The main benefit of failure is that it forces you to take action. That's why people see a benefit to failure. That's why there's this, I want to say, cult of failure a little bit. It's always better to succeed than to fail. But if you're failing, it's good to fail fast and it's good to learn your lesson. There's things to be learned. But that's where the, the, the failure really gets highlighted is that it forces you to take action. But that doesn't mean that you can't force yourself to take action on regular intervals in things that aren't just about failure. And that's what Peaks and Valleys, the book we'll talk about on Thursday, talks about is taking those actions along with successes as well and having kind of milestones that you can hit in your personal and professional life that can encourage that action. So even if you're not failing, you're being able to take action on things. 
The other thing that failure does is it tests the results of your actions. There is no greater clarification that you're on the right track or on the wrong track than when you're failing. And so it is a crystal clear test of a particular action that you're taking. And that's one of the reasons, or a couple of the reasons, while failure is something that gets talked about a lot and gets looked at as a positive, and it can absolutely be turned into a positive, is that it forces you to take action and it's a very clear indication of how your actions are doing. It's that smack in the face. Sometimes you're getting moderate successes or watered down successes, but when you have those failures, it definitely gets thrown in your face, shall we say, a little bit. So if we have people jump on here, if you've got any questions, go ahead, drop them down in the comment section. Happy to take them. Otherwise, I've got a few more things in regards to failure to talk about and kind of fill this out while we're waiting for our first questions. The big, big mistake that I see when I talk to coaching clients that I have or when I'm talking to people after conferences, that sort of thing, the one thing that I see consistently when we start talking about a failure or a struggle that they're going through is one of the main excuses that people use is it's a very unique situation that led to a failure. And in most instances, it is not a unique situation that caused the failure. It may have exacerbated it, but there is a more basic fundamental issue that needed to be addressed that resulted in the failure that was overlooked, that was miscommunicated, that sort of thing. So don't fall, but the biggest excuse is one of the reasons that people don't learn from failure is they use the excuse that it was something unique. Well, this is just a one-off instance, or you know, it was only because it was this particular customer, or this particular client, or this particular employee, or this particular project. They look for the unique things for the excuses, not the commonplace things that could have been used to shore up the failure and see that it didn't take place in the first place. So when you're looking at failures, don't look for the unique factors that led to the failure. Look for the commonplace issues that resulted in the failure that you could have used to prevent it from occurring in the first place. So one of the main things to mention on there. Mohammed, thanks for the comment there. And Sarah's got our first question today and it's, how fast should you roll out new ideas when starting in a new company? My, my gut reaction is one month in. That should be the soonest. And I'll tell you why, Sarah, and, and you can actually you can actually mitigate or come back on that just a little bit. The first thing to do, Sarah, is to spend a good two weeks minimum gathering information. That's that and, and so I might say that two weeks is your bare minimum for rolling something new out. But I think that one month is more logical because of this. I've talked a lot about the five questions. When you start with a new company, one of the best ways to gather information is from the frontline employees. Preferably meet with every single employee under your control. If that, you know, if you're in a retail store and there's 50 employees, that may not be re realistic, but you can meet with all the department heads and you can meet with some of the leads or some of the more senior employees and you ask them five questions. What do you see going right in the organization? What do you see going wrong in the organization? Where are there improvements we need to, or where are there opportunities we need to take advantage of? Where are there problems we need to fix? And how can I help you do a better job? Now, for those of you that have heard me mention those five things before, my challenge to you is have you asked all of your employees about it? Because even if you're not new, you will get a ton of information and a ton of good ideas. And Sarah, what that does is that gives you some feedback and what you're gonna get is some low hanging fruit, some easy problems to fix, some easy problems to take advantage of. And so after your week or two weeks of gathering feedback and getting up to speed on the operation and its challenges and its opportunities and some of its workflows, you can take advantage of those low hanging fruits and put those into place. So two weeks to gather information, and I say two weeks to put in some of those quick wins, those easy wins, and what that does is that tells people that you are going to be listening to them, that you value that their opinion, and it gives them, those people that gave you some ideas are going to be able to um, take some ownership over that low-hanging fruit that you've put into place. 
And that's gonna help any changes that you wanna put into place, some big stuff that you wanna put into place one month in, two months in. That's what creates that buy-in that makes that change much easier to put into place. So I say one month because that, that, that allows two weeks to gather feedback, two weeks to get some quick wins and let everybody know you're gonna take advantage and get some allies. Um, on your team before you start rolling out some bigger changes that are in place. What you may find and what is likely to occur is that that initial feedback from those two weeks will give you weeks and weeks of quick wins, easy wins that help you formulate a team. And it's those wins that are actually a better use of your time initially as you continue to gain information, then maybe those big initiatives that you thought you needed to put into place, you may be able to accomplish some of those goals with those simple and easy tasks that you have into place. I'm glad you like it, Sarah, and that you're gonna find that it works for you. I'm not gonna say I hope it works for you because I know it will work for you. People love talking about those, their jobs and when they start seeing that you're taking action on what they're saying, you can actually go back to them two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later, and ask them those five questions again. And what's gonna happen is, is once they realize that you're listening and you're taking action on what they're saying, you're gonna get a flood of new information and new ideas from the same people and from different people who may not have felt comfortable sharing with you initially as to what was going on. But that's definitely gonna work for you, Sarah. So. That's my take. Get the buy-in first and then roll out some of your new initiatives and some of those big things that you want to put in place and that you're excited to put into place in that new position. Great. So again, anybody has any questions on here, go ahead, drop them into the comment section. I will tackle them in real time. Happy to. Um, first time back here after three weeks off, so I'm feeling fresh and ready to tackle things. The other thing we're talking, dealing with failure is, is kind of the, um, the thread we're weaving through this entire episode of Mentor Minutes. And the thing about failure is that it is backwards looking. The reason that people have a culture of failure is because they're always looking back. What you need to do to get over your failures, and if you have a culture of failure, what you need to do, go ahead, fire away, Sarah, what you need to do is you need to focus on action. One of the best ways we talk about people getting stagnant and they, they're stuck in a rut and they're feeling down and all of those things. The best way to get out of those situations is to take some sort of action. So sure, you've had a failure as far as sales. What is the simplest thing that you can put into place? The simplest action that you can take in regards to a particular problem that gets you on the road to action. It may be that the project is, I'll draw the analogy of hiking a mountain at night. You can't see the whole path until you start making progress and then you will see further and further and further and hopefully the dawn starts coming and you see even further along the path. But take a concrete action. If you don't take that action, it's hard to see things down the road and you get stuck in that rut and you get stuck in those doldrums. Failure is a backwards looking thing. And don't get me wrong, reviewing you know, past mistakes can be applicable if you take action on what you learn. And so the action is what you need to be focused on. Any review of failure needs to be addressed in actions that need to be taken to address it. Um, yeah, Sarah, there's one person in your apartment that, and it looks like it cut out early, so you can follow up in another comment. Um, Eknax got the next question. It's how do you handle multiple reporting hierarchy with a common goal? Well, the fact that you identified the common goal, Eknath, actually tackles one of the main problems um, with a multiple um, reporting hierarchy is that um, they don't have a clearly defined goal. And so for those of you that have um, are reporting to multiple bosses. Or this happens a lot as far as working with a team of different departments. You know, you take something from one department, tackle it with your team and pass it along to another department is that they all have different goals, initial or, um, departmental goals that may be at odds. And so getting crystal clear on what the main goal of the organization is or the main goal of your teams are, is the thing that cuts through so many problems in regards to a multiple reporting hierarchy. 
One of the big things as far as reporting to different bosses is finding a way to, and it, it varies by organization, but finding a way to bring those bosses into one room with you. And this can be, you know, using particular projects is a great way to do that, okay? So, you know, we're working on this particular thing and it touches on three different bosses. We'll bring them into one of those meetings and so that they see and that they can recognize that you do report to more than just one person. Because as much as they consciously acknowledge that, what happens in organizations is that emotionally that person can consciously acknowledge it, but they want more of your time. They want more of your focus. And so what you need to do is you need to give them opportunities to see and to reinforce that mental aspect of it and not the emotional aspect of wanting it. So find ways to um, discuss other, other aspects of what you do. Giving a weekly update. What I tell people a lot of times in these cases is make sure that you're giving a weekly or bi-weekly one-on-one. It can be even if they won't meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, it can be a weekly email update on what you're working on. And what you do is you include all of the other areas that you're working on as well. So it may be that I report to Eknath and I report to Sarah. So I'm gonna go ahead and send my weekly update. Hey, this is what Cameron's working on this week. For Eknath, I'm doing this, 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 and this. And I'm including in that, Sarah, I am also working on this, this, and this. And that way, Eknath is aware of what else I'm working on, where those other priorities lie. And if you have that common goal within the organization, that's something that can help um, cut through some of that. Because usually people are incentivized on an overall goal, not just a department goal. So they see the benefit. There is a benefit to them of using your time well across departments or across um, different reporting structures. So I hope that helps you out, Eknath. If you have any follow-up question on that, then definitely let me know um, and in, in further comments down here and we'll keep carrying on this particular conversation. Um, and Sarah, if you're still on, I'd love to know what this one person in the department, um, if it, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, and, and I'll kind of fill in the blanks here for Sarah. You start, I wanna to say too many times we focus on one person in the organization. And we use that as the litmus test for how we are doing. So we have 12 employees, but where we end up focusing our time is on the one employee that doesn't like us, that is always resistant to change. And what I'm here to tell you is you will never, or I will say very rarely, and you definitely need to enjoy it when it occurs, um, you will rarely ever have all 100% of your team on board. And if you do feel like you have 100% of your team on board, be aware that there may be one that's kind of a shadowy double agent on there. It's just human nature. They're not gonna get along with your personality. They're gonna have things going on in their personal life that conflict with what you're asking them to do. There's all kinds of reasons why somebody might not be on board with your leadership. The best leaders that are out there have had a subset of their population of employees that didn't like their leadership. And so that's very normal. And what I want to make sure that you're focused on is that the one person isn't detracting from the other nine people that you're dealing with, okay? It's good to take their feedback and you want to make sure that you are bridging the gap when you have one particularly difficult employee to deal with. You want to bridge that gap. You want to lean into that communication. You don't want to lean back because that actually fosters more problems down the road. But don't let the one detractor stop you from making improvements that help the other 90% of the employees that you have. You will rarely ever be able to address 100% of the issues that are out there with your team. And so don't fall into that trap of looking for those times because what, that happen, what happens with that is inaction. You can take that, ben, that step forward and eventually address something in regards to that one employee that you couldn't help out with the last action that you took. So while I wait for any more questions that are on here, I got another comment in regards to dealing with failure. Again, the kind of thread through this whole uh, mentor minutes. And I will continue to do these threads. Um, I find it, it helps bridge the gap between questions and it helps create kind of an overall flow for these mentor minute sessions that makes it a little bit easier for everybody when listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube to get some, dive a little bit deeper into some of these particular topics. So you'll see this occur with each one of these podcasts, each one of these mentor minute sessions where I will have a theme running through it. 
Um, the other thing to address in regards to failure is that the quicker you address failure, the less impact it has on the organ, on, on the less, less impact the failure has. My goodness, I'm tripping all over my words here in this first session back. So the reason I mention that is because what happens is, is you see the trend, okay? Revenue declined week over week, for instance. I'll use retail examples or e-commerce examples out there. So revenue, instead of going steady and trending up, last week it actually went down. The question is, is what are you going to do about that? Consider that a failure, if you will. What happens a lot of times is there's that first indication of failure or a problem as far as how you're resonating with customers or how your employees are selling or something wrong with the website or something like that. There's that first indication. And what happens is, is we often wait and see. Well, it's just a one-off. You know, it was just one week. We had a bad day. It was a tough comp, you know, to, that we were going against. Those sorts of things. And so you don't address the failure. And so what happens is, is week two hits and it continues to slide. Well, now I've got some concerns. Now I'm gonna start diving into it a little bit more maybe. Or, again, as often happens, well, again, we're heading into a really busy season. Now it's a little bit of a slower season, that sort of thing. And so you wait again. And then it's three weeks down the road. And all of a sudden, you've taken two and three weeks to take action on something. The same thing happens with employees. You know what? Cameron isn't doing particularly well in selling this particular product. Well, he'll come along. Or I've got other things to deal with. And you know, then another week goes by, and another week goes by. And so now all of a sudden, Cameron's gotten worse and worse, and Cameron's created some momentum, and now Cameron has some negative imaging, and now Cameron is more negative towards the organization. And so it spirals. But if you had addressed it right away, you know what, Cameron just didn't get this new procedure. He's been struggling. He's in the bottom quarter of my employees as far as this particular procedure. If you jump on the failure quickly, you mitigate the impact that it has down the road because you're taking those measures to address it. Now, you don't want to be paranoid. Don't get me wrong. You don't want to be, you know, it's shiny penny syndrome. Oh, there's the shiny penny. Oh, oh, you know, you don't want to be jumping around with things. So sometimes things do need to take time. You prioritize those things. But be on the lookout for those failures and those things that you can step into and help address with people, with projects, with situations that are going to help turn that failure around quicker and quicker. Failures don't often fix themselves. They often get worse. And so make sure that you're stepping into the breach and fixing those things where you can. It is worth your time. The big thing that occurs with this is I'm focused on other areas. I have other priorities. But look at what could happen one week, two weeks, one month, two months down the road. If you don't step into it now, what sort of priority does that become down the road? So look at potential future priorities when assessing your time. And it is easier to deal with things right away than it is to deal with them down the road. It's easier to address poor employee performance with a new procedure right away than three months after the training takes place when it's clear, crystal clear that there's a failure. So look at those opportunities to jump on a failure right away to spend a little bit of time to get an outsized benefit down the road if things don't turn around on their own. The other thing, and again, any questions you have, drop them down into the comment section. I know we've got other people that have jumped on midstream here. Um, the, the things that you want to address, so let's say you made a failure. One of the big things is fessing up to the failure and telling your boss that you've fallen short on something. And there's really kind of four steps that I want to go over in regards to failing and letting the boss know. You want to report the failure. So you want to be the person that tells your boss about a failure. You do not. The worst thing that can happen is for somebody else to tell your boss something that's going wrong in their department, which is your department. So you report it first. You tell them what the plan is going to be. So you report the problem. So we have an issue in regards to decreasing sales last month. This is what we are going to do about it. What is the plan moving forward? Okay, so you get them focused, not on the problem, but you get them focused on the actions that you are going to take. Okay, 
first and foremost talk about future actions. People don't want, you know, a lot of us have heard this from the, your, their bosses. Don't tell me about problems. Tell me about solutions and what you're going to do about those problems. So report the problem. It is. Factually, you know, you, you fell short on a project. Um, this employee isn't working out. You've had excessive turnover. There's been a product um, issue that has come up. All of those things. Report that but let them know what the plan is moving forward. They will always comment on whether they, what they think about your plan, but let them know that you've done that foresight, okay? So that's the first thing. Then you actually deal with the cause. So a lot of times what happens is, is people do a root cause analysis right away. Do that after you've discussed the plan. So report the issue, talk about the plan, then tell them what the root cause was. We have not engaged with this particular demographic. There was a, you know, this particular product didn't come out. What is the what is the cause? Be factual with it and what the resolution to that cause was. And that's where you tie back into that plan. So we have redone the manufacturing on this particular aspect of the product and we are rolling it out into organizations as I kind of laid out right now. Our sales are down. So we've retrained the staff on upselling in particular areas because we weren't upselling um, in those areas before we've rolled that out and we will continue to roll it out down the road So the four steps when you fail at something and you've got to fess up to the boss The four things that you want to deal with Report the issue be honest and upfront It's better that they hear it from you than somebody else Talk about the plan moving forward what you're gonna do about it What the cause of the issue was and what the resolution to that cause was okay? So a lot of times the plan actually comes at the end. A lot of people make the mistake of reporting an issue, talking about the cause, talking about the resolution, and then talking about the plan, okay? You want to give them dessert first, okay? So I've got an issue, but here's my plan for getting out of it so that it isn't something that you have to worry about because they're going to move quickly into what to do, what action to make this go away. A failure is like get burning your hand on the stove. Let them know that the first step is taking it off of that. That's our plan. Our plan, we're burning our hand on this stove. Our first step is we're going to release this, then we're going to go get ice. The problem was we didn't realize that the stove was on. We're going to fix that by having a red light installed on the stove so that we can see that the burners are hot. Wow, that was a really good analogy I came up with right off the top of my head. But that's how you handle the fessing up to failure, which can be a huge issue um, for any of us that are out there. Um, the other thing is and, and this kind of ties into dealing with failure quickly, addressing it right away. Because the quicker you identify, you deal with a failure, the less effort you have to put into it to turn it around. So identifying those failures is kind of an art form to a certain extent. And what I really go back to is metrics and triggers, okay? And you likely have these things in place, but you're not looking to utilize them as quickly as you might want to. And so what you want to do is you want to define ahead of time at what point in this metric, okay, so if I've got call abandonment, if I have sales, if I have returns, if I have invoices processed, at what point of a decrease or a slowdown and increase do I need to take action? So define that ahead of time so that you don't get caught in the emotional turmoil of whether you should address it or whether you should work on this other stuff that you've been working on ahead of time. So what are your metrics and what are your triggers? So a common, we talk metrics and I talk sales, invoices, all of those things, we have those. But what do I mean by triggers? Triggers, can, the most obvious example is a return. So you know what, somebody returned our product, what happened? What are the steps that I'm going to take to address it? Am I going to refund? Am I going to find a reason why they returned it? Do I have to put something in place to get that reason why they returned it? Are we doing a follow-up call? What are those things where you had a failure in service that caused a return? What is the root cause of that so that you can then address it down the road? You define these things ahead of time. If you can define it ahead of time, you're more likely to follow through with it and you're more likely to get the benefit down the road. It's kind of like setting a goal for yourself. If you get crystal clear on what the goal is, you're more likely to attain it. 
So do the same thing in regards to your failures and managing your failures. And that's something that can be hugely helpful down the road in getting the most out of them and helping you um, kind of move forward from those things. So again, any question, I've only got two more comments in regards to failure, kind of tying that as the, uh, the theme of this particular episode of Mentor Minute. But if you do, anybody that's on here, if you have any struggles, any questions in regards to leadership, I'm here to help, happy to help, and refreshed after three weeks off. So um, the next thing is, and I hit on this before, I'm glad you liked it below. The, I've hit on this before, don't just deal with failures. We look for failures, that opportunity to learn. Learn from failure, a, almost cliche at this point, all right? And a lot of us are very poor at that, don't get me wrong. We, 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 failure isn't fun, and so we look to minimize it as much as possible. We look to get past it. We don't wanna dwell on failure and try to learn something from it. We just wanna get past it and move on from it. And that's a very natural, very human emotion from it. But one way to kind of flip that around is see what you can learn from your successes, okay? Learn from failure, but learn from success as well. So you just had the best month in sales ever in your department's history, or you just processed the most invoices, or you just shipped the most orders. You hit some sort of record, or you hit some sort of success. What happened? We do all kinds of lesson learned sessions from failure and after big projects. But a lot of the times that gets overlooked when you had a big success because it worked out how you, everybody, you wouldn't try to do something if you didn't think it was going to be successful in most cases. And so, okay, it was a success, great, our plan worked. But what can you learn from that? What led to that success? What helped ensure that it was a success? Again, you are not looking talking about failure, we excuse things through unique instances, okay? So we're saying the unique factors that led to failure is the excuse. Don't, look for the commonplace things. Same thing, you may have had the best month ever in regards to sales because it was Black Friday and it was Cyber Monday and it's leading into the Christmas season. So of course, that's going to be your busiest time of year, that's gonna be your biggest sales numbers but what are the commonplace things that led into that? What was the marketing efforts that went into it? What was the fulfillment of orders? What was the staffing levels? That, you know, What did you anticipate? What were the things that you did that ensured that that was a success? Sure, look for some unique things that you can roll out and make commonplace, but what were the commonplace things that you got right? Because you will get some reinforcement on those things that you can then roll out in other areas of the operation at other times of the operation, and you're learning from those successes. I'd like to say you can double your rate of learning simply by learning from your failures, but also learning from your successes. And in fact, you can actually learn a lot more because most of the time you are successful in what you're looking to do. 90 plus percent of the time, it's a success every day. It's only that 5%, 10%, 2% of, of the time where it's a failure that we're looking to gain those insights from. And that can be a huge mistake in the development of your career and the development of your skill set as a leader. Last thing that I wanted to mention in regards to failure is to forget it and to put it behind you, all right? Once you have learned those lessons, once you have taken the action, all right, once you've cemented those things, then let it go, all right? Too many of us are carrying the burdens of failures that we have learned from and that aren't going to recur. There are lessons that you have learned earlier in your career that you are still carrying with you likely that don't have any impact on what you're doing now, all right? I have learned to manage my anger or frustration better in my leadership role. But I can remember those times when I shouted at a particular employee on the sales floor, all right? Unforgivable in that particular instance. Poor leadership, but I have learned and I have moved past it and I need to let that go. And so don't let go too early, make sure that you're learning. But if you've learned from the failure, if you've cemented what took place and you've taken action to address it in the future, then let it go. It serves no further purpose to carry it along with you in your little knapsack of leadership tools than the actions and stuff that came out of that and that you learned from it. So again, love being back. Thrilled to be back after a few weeks off. Nice and refreshed. So we'll get to doing these on a daily basis. So look for this around noontime, Pacific Standard Time. That seems to be around the time that I do it. 
could be a little earlier, could be a little bit later. And if you have any questions, if you came to this late, drop down in the comments, let the question be heard, and I will get that on tomorrow's episode of Mentor Minutes, or if you need more, something a little bit more anonymous and private because of the issues that you're dealing with, you can always direct message me on Facebook or send me an email, cm at cameronmorsey.com. But always, it's great to be here, and I'm just pleased to be able to be of service to you. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.